Dell's G15 was shaping up to be the worst gaming laptop that we've ever tested, but I think I fixed it. Let me explain. This is actually the second 12th gen G15 laptop that we've tested. We had to send the first one back because it was so bad. And although this replacement was a little better, it still had many of the same problems. And I also want to note that both laptops were review samples, I didn't buy them. So for that small minority of viewers that actually think that us reviewers get sent golden sample laptops that are perfect and better than what you would actually buy at the shop, just hang on a moment. The main problem that we had with both G15 laptops was that they just kept on blue screening all the time. And based on some of the reviews on Dell's website, we're not alone here. Before we get deep into that, this part of the video has been sponsored by TCL and their new C-series TV, the C835. It's easy to set up and get straight into what matters most, watching romance movies. Uh, I mean gaming. That's because this 4K 144Hz mini LED TV has variable refresh rate support. It's FreeSync Premium certified, so you know you're getting a smooth tear-free experience in games. Not only that, but with TCL's auto low latency mode, the TV automatically recognizes gaming devices and adjusts the settings for you, reducing lag time and improving latency. This means it's optimized and ready to go for whatever console you connect, or even a PC or gaming laptop like I've got here, along with other great features like HDR10+, Dolby Vision IQ and Dolby Atmos, the C835 with Quantum Dot technology is perfect for viewing content. Combined with Google TV, you can browse 400,000 plus movies and TV episodes in one place. So no more getting lost in all your apps and subscriptions. Check out TCL's latest C-Series range with the link below the video. The first G15 we had was way worse. It would literally just blue screen if you had it sitting there like this doing completely nothing. We had at least 30 blue screens in just the first few days, making the laptop completely unusable. And with that first laptop, we couldn't even properly open the Alienware command center software, which is kind of important because it's used to adjust things like the performance modes. It just got stuck trying to load anything and we could never properly use it, and we even tried completely uninstalling it and re-downloading it from the Dell website and installing it again, but this didn't fix anything. Now this second laptop didn't even have the Alienware command center installed by default, so you also couldn't do things like change the performance modes. We installed it ourselves from the Dell website and it's been working perfectly fine, but before we did that we did use Dell's update software to see if it was available to install and it didn't even show up as an option, it thought it was fully up to date without it being there. So yeah, kind of weird that the Alienware command center software did come installed on our first laptop but it was completely broken, and then it wasn't even on our second laptop at all. You can't even really argue that this laptop isn't meant to have the software, because it's there on the download page for this exact model. Anyway, at least the software now worked on our second model, but it was still having random blue screens. The reasons weren't really obvious, because it could happen at literally any moment, but the event logs generally seemed to point to the Alienware Command Center executable. The Alienware Command Center was at least a little faster to open compared to when I reviewed last year's G15, but not by much. Last year after a reboot, it took more than a full minute before the software was in a usable state, but you still get an admin prompt for whatever reason if you open it before it fully loads in the background. Honestly, it's just kind of a joke when the competition, like Asus Armory Crate, opens pretty much instantly as soon as the laptop's powered on and logged in. If you turn this laptop on and let it sit there for a few minutes, the software will load up in the background so that when you click the icon, it will open straight away. But it still takes a really long time for it to get ready in the background. And if the software isn't ready, you can't use things like the G shortcut to enable gaming mode, or G mode as I call it, to boost performance. Then again, maybe that's fine, because as you'll see a bit later, sometimes the games would actually run slower with G mode enabled. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Personally, I think Dell just needs to start from scratch and make the software again. There are just too many bits and pieces all over the place that are probably managed by different teams, and it just doesn't come together in one cohesive, easy to use solution. And there are also parts that just don't do anything because the software was clearly backported from Alienware. I mean it's even called the Alienware Command Center, this isn't an Alienware laptop. 
<sighs> Getting back to the issue of the blue screens, I think I solved it by updating the Intel graphics drivers. Ever since I did that, this laptop has been completely rock solid with no blue screens at all. I even left it powered on for multiple days just to confirm that, and it survived all of our usual benchmark tests and stress tests for this review without blue screening. We don't normally install the latest Intel integrated graphics drivers from Intel's website when doing a gaming laptop review. And the reason for that is when you actually go to install the latest version, it warns you against doing it. It mentions that the OEM, Dell in this case, might have made customizations to their integrated graphics drivers in order to make it work the best for their specific laptop, such as giving it the best battery life. Honestly, the only reason I updated the Intel graphics drivers was a bit of a guess. I was out of options at that point and didn't know what was causing the blue screens. But it was the only change I did that actually seems to have fixed it. Now, while it's great that I have been able to fix this laptop and make it behave normally without blue screening every few minutes, let's be real, most people aren't going to go out of their way and go to the Intel website and manually update the graphics drivers. Most people will just use Microsoft's Windows update, and if you're lucky, they might find the Dell update software and get some Dell specific drivers that way. And the versions hosted by Windows Update and Dell are just going to be older than what's available through Intel's website. But in theory, at some point, both Windows Update and Dell's website will be updated to get the latest version that Intel has that fixes the blue screen. So I had all these problems around mid-July 2022, and I wouldn't be surprised if other people that bought this laptop in that time also had those problems. Now, I could completely understand if this was just some one-off issue that only happened with our first G15 laptop. Problems happen, I get it, but as we had basically the exact same set of problems on our second laptop, that tells me that it could be a more widespread issue. At the same time, by the time that you're watching this video, maybe the updates have rolled out through Windows Update or Dell's Update software, and this isn't actually a problem anymore. But still, I can't just ignore this terrible experience that we've had over the last few weeks while trying to test this machine. I'm not just going to sit here and pretend that all those blue screens didn't happen. Alright, so with those issues out of the way, which could be fixed at any time with an update, let's get into the rest of the review. The whole laptop is plastic with a dark shadow grey finish, but you can also pay more for the Obsidian Black Special Edition, which weighs a little extra, but also has a 12 zone RGB light bar on the front that will be sure to boost FPS in games. The build quality feels decent considering the plastic design, though the front corners could feel a little sharp. There's only a little flex to the keyboard when pushing pushing down hard. It felt fairly sturdy during normal use. There was more flex to the lid compared to most other laptops, and while doing this, I noticed that the bottom feet aren't too grippy as it can slide on my desk without pushing too hard. But again, just sitting there using it normally was fine. Despite the more flexible screen, there's only a very minor amount of wobble to the screen when typing. The hinges felt sturdy enough even when ripping open the lid at high speed, which simulates you checking out my latest video after subscribing to the channel. There's no specific spot on the front for getting your finger in to open the lid, but it was still easy to do, and the screen goes back around 138 degrees. The laptop alone weighs 2.6 kilos or 5.8 pounds, then increases to 3.7 kilos or over 8.1 pounds with the fairly large 240 watt power brick and cables for charging. It's a bit deeper compared to most other 15 inch laptops as the back sticks out a bit, and it's a little thicker too. We'll see if this gives us good thermals soon. The configuration I've got has Intel's Core i7 12700H CPU, Nvidia's RTX 3070 Ti graphics, 16 gigs of DDR5 memory, and a 15.6 inch 1080p 165Hz screen. You can customize it quite a few different ways with the link below the video, which will affect the price. There's a 720p camera above the screen in the middle, and it does not have Windows Hello face unlock. Here's how the camera and microphone look and sound, and here's how it sounds while typing on the keyboard. And there's only a really minor amount of wobble to the screen while doing this. It's not bad at all. My second G15 has a 4 zone RGB backlit keyboard, but our first one had orange lighting only. There are options to choose from when buying. All keys and secondary functions get lit up, and you can turn the lighting on or off with the F5 shortcut key. You can customize the lighting through the FX tab in the Alienware command center software with a few different effects. And you get more granular brightness control here too. By default, the key lights turn off after a minute of inactivity, and I could only change this through the BIOS. 
Previous Dell laptops have Power Manager software that let you do it in software, but this wasn't installed on either of our laptops. It might be possible to get it manually. After all, our second unit didn't even have Alienware Command Center by default. I liked typing on the keyboard and thought it was fine, though I'm not a fan of the small arrow keys. I don't use numpads, but my partner does and she liked this one. Though we're not sure why two buttons need to be dedicated to opening the calculator and clearing it for a laptop aimed at gamers. Hmm, interesting. I thought the touchpad worked well. I liked the click and it feels accurate to use, though it's perhaps a little small feeling as it's squashed down the front due to the air vents that are above the keyboard. The left side has an air exhaust vent towards the back, a gigabit ethernet port and a 3.5mm audio combo jack. The right side has a couple of USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports and there's an air exhaust vent on this side too. The rest of the ports are on the back in between air exhaust vents. From left to right there's a Type-C Thunderbolt 4 port, third USB 3 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port, HDMI 2.1 output, and the circular power input on the right. Thunderbolt only seems to be available in the higher tier 3060 and 3070 Ti configurations, and not the 3050 or 3050 Ti versions. Unfortunately there's no Type-C charging, but you can connect a monitor to the Type-C port, as it has DisplayPort support. With Optimus on, connecting an external screen to the Type-C port goes to the integrated graphics, but with Optimus off, the Type-C port instead connects directly to the Nvidia graphics, which may be preferable for VR. Now although this laptop has advanced Optimus, you can't actually use that when you have an external screen connected. So there's no way to just use the software to get the Type-C port connecting to the Nvidia graphics. You have to use the regular old MUX switch. And for some reason, unlike other laptops from other brands, Dell doesn't give you the option to do this through software. So you have to first boot into the BIOS in order to change from integrated to dedicated graphics. And once you do that, you won't have the option of Optimus without going back into the BIOS. So basically you'll only really want to do this if you need that Type-C port to be straight on the Nvidia graphics or something. There's an option that sounds like with Optimus on, the Type-C port will go to the discrete graphics, but this did not work for me. The HDMI port on the other hand always connected to the Nvidia graphics regardless of whether Optimus was on or off, and we confirmed it could run a 4K screen at 120Hz 8-bit with G-Sync. Getting inside was very simple. There are eight Phillips head screws, but only the two at the top and two down the bottom actually come out of the panel. The other four screws raise up the panel so you can easily pull it off without tools. Inside we've got the battery down the front, two memory slots just above on the left side, along with the SSD and Wi-Fi 6 card on the far left. It looks like there's room for a second M.2 drive, but there's not actually a connector soldered onto the motherboard. So it seems like you can only install one drive unless I'm missing something, because last year's model let you install two drives. The 512 gig drive that's installed performs alright, but not super impressive or anything. As you can only install one drive, you'll want to make sure you buy with the right size in mind. Upgrading the SSD later would mean either a fresh install of Windows or somehow cloning the drive. The Wi-Fi performance was fine, but not as good compared to last year's AMD based G15 from Dell, which was one of the higher results I've recorded. I know normally give a full point to the upgradability score for each SSD that can be installed, so that's why this year's G15 gets a 5 rather than a 6 like last year's version, as last year's could take 2. The speakers are found towards the front on the left and right sides. I thought they sounded about average for a gaming laptop. There's not really any bass, but they get fairly loud and there wasn't much palm rest vibration. The latency mon results weren't great, but I've seen worse. My G15 is powered by a 86 watt hour battery and the Dell website says that in many regions this is only available in the 3060 or 3070 Ti configuration, while the lower spec 3050 or 3050 Ti options get a smaller 56 watt hour battery. But this might vary by regions as Dell are known to offer different customizations in different regions. You can use the My Dell software to set different charging modes, which may help prolong the lifespan of the battery by not keeping it fully charged all the time. For all my earlier hate towards 
towards Dell software earlier, I've got to give them credit for letting us customise granular charge levels here. Most laptops that offer this feature don't let you customise it, and even more don't even have the option to limit the charge level at all. It's actually doing quite well when compared to other Intel laptops at just under 6 hours in my YouTube video playback test. In order to get much higher than that, in most cases, we're looking at AMD Ryzen based machines. Take Dell's AMD based G15 from last year with the same sized battery at the top for example. I also want to note that the first G15 we had that was sent back due to the problems mentioned earlier only lasted for 4 hours in the same test. Though it did blue screen a few times and rebooting would probably draw more power than otherwise. Considering this workload runs on Intel's integrated graphics and my fix for the blue screens was updating those drivers, well it might explain the difference. Perhaps there was just something majorly wrong in the older drivers. Let's check out thermals next. Inside we only get to see two fans, as the heat pipes are on the other side of the motherboard. If you want to change the thermal paste, you'll need to take out the motherboard and flip it. Air gets exhausted out of both the left and right sides, as well as out of the back, and there are quite a few holes covered by mesh for air to get in on the bottom panel directly above the fans. Alienware's command center software lets us change between a few different built-in performance modes. From lowest to highest, we've tested quiet mode, balanced mode, and performance mode. The MyDell software also has a thermal tab with cool, optimized, quiet, and ultra performance modes. If I set quiet mode in the Alienware command center and close the MyDell software and reopen it, it will update to also reflect this. So it just seems to be another interface to the same settings but with different names. Definitely not confusing. You can also press the G key, the F9 shortcut, to enable high performance mode. I call this G mode because the G changes to blue in the software. I think it would have been good if we could just click the G in software to turn this on or off, but that doesn't do anything. The overclock option in the software doesn't have any built in overclock presets like you might see from a higher tier Alienware laptop, so it instead takes you to the fusion tab where you've got some basic control over the fans. I didn't change any of these for the thermal testing and kept everything to Dell's defaults. The internal temperatures were on the warmer side when just sitting there idle, but realistically this isn't really a problem unless the machine feels warm to use. We'll check that in a moment. Nvidia's GPU thermal throttle limit is 87 degrees Celsius, and this was being hit in performance mode, as well as some CPU thermal throttling too. Enabling G mode was able to lower the temperatures significantly, while the cooling pad I test with, linked below the video, was also able to take off a further 7 to 8 degrees, likely thanks to the big mesh area underneath making the cooling pad more useful. Although performance mode was running the hottest, it's also giving us the highest CPU clock speeds too. And they're even higher compared to G mode, which is meant to be a higher option. Interestingly, the lowest quiet mode was able to run the CPU at similar clock speeds despite running cooler and quieter, and that's because the GPU is heavily limited in this mode. Personally, I prefer this. A lot of other laptops will limit the CPU performance significantly in the lowest mode, but it just makes using the laptop and opening any program slow to the point where I never use the low performance modes. We can see where the higher performance comes from when looking at the power levels being reached. The RTX 3070 Ti graphics can run up to 140 watts with Nvidia's dynamic boost, which generally happens when the CPU isn't also loaded up. The GPU was thermal throttling in performance mode at around 116 watts, while the CPU was running at 45 watts. Interestingly, enabling G mode gets us around 10 watts more GPU power by increasing the limit to 125 watts, but it does this at the expense of reducing the the CPU power limit. Using the cooling pad was able to further boost the GPU power limit up to the full 140 watts though. It seems that the G15 is able to make use of that extra thermal headroom when it's available. Here's how an actual game performs with the different performance modes in use. The frame rates were actually worse with Dell's high performance G mode enabled. Given we've got a 1080p screen, it's possible that some games will run better with higher CPU power compared to more GPU power. So this is what can happen 
happen. Honestly, 30 watts for 14 cores for an Intel CPU in a gaming laptop seems a bit low to me. The CPU can boost higher to around 90 watts when the GPU isn't in use, but it's not stacking up super well compared to most other laptops with the same i7-12700H CPU. Dell's G15 is only slightly ahead of MSI's GP66 just below it in multi-core, otherwise most others were able to do a fair bit better. The single core score was also lower compared to the other 12th gen CPUs tested. Performance drops back when we unplug the charger and instead run purely off of battery power. The single core score is actually decent now compared to many of those other Intel 12th gen laptops as it doesn't lower as much. But the multi-core performance gets reduced significantly. This could in part be why the G15 lasted longer on battery compared to most other 12th gen laptops. It just uses less power on battery, but the trade-off is lower performance, as seen here. Most laptops I test are in the low 30 degrees Celsius range on the keyboard at idle, and Dell's G15 was right in line with this despite the higher idle internal temperatures. It's only a little warmer with the stress test running in silent mode. It only felt a little warm. Stepping up to balanced mode gets warmer towards the center, but it didn't feel uncomfortable at all. Just a bit warm still. The higher performance mode wasn't much different. It was quite warm right up the back where the vents are above the keyboard, but you don't need to touch there. Let's have a listen to the fans. The fans sounded silent when just sitting there idle in quiet mode. The fans get louder with the higher performance modes as you'd expect, but G mode enabled was louder compared to having it off. G mode on was running cooler, but this is probably more due to the CPU power limit dipping from 45 to 30 watts than the fan speed increase. Just before we get into the game benchmarks, let's check out the screen, given that's what you're actually going to be staring at when playing games. The G15 is available with a number of different screens, so expect different results with different panels. I've got a 1080p 165Hz screen, but I'd expect the cheaper 120Hz screen to look worse. The G15 has a MUX switch, but you can only turn it on or off through the BIOS, so a little inconvenient compared to most gaming laptops that have an option through the software to do this. To be fair, those laptops still require a reboot to apply the change, but you don't usually have to go into the BIOS to make the change. It's not the end of the world though, because the G15 also has Advanced Optimus, which means you can swap between Optimus and the discrete graphics and software without a reboot, or let it automatically select the best GPU for whatever you're running. The only caveat is if you want the Type-C port to connect to the Nvidia graphics, then you have to use the BIOS option, as mentioned earlier. With Optimus off, the 165Hz screen has G-Sync, but you can still get Adaptive Sync with Optimus on, so no tearing either either way, though I'm not too sure if the other screen options have G-Sync too. The Dell website doesn't actually say. The color gamut is okay for a machine designed for gaming. Personally, I'd want something better for content creation. I suspect the 240Hz 1440p screen would be better in that regard, and that's also brighter at 400 nits. Dell advertises the 165Hz screen that I've got at 300 nits, and I found mine to max out at 335 nits on 100% brightness. That cheaper 120 20Hz screen is advertised at 250 nits, which I think is a bit too low. If you're planning on connecting a better monitor, then it doesn't really matter and you could save some money on the cheaper screen. I measured the average greater gray response time of the screen at around 8 milliseconds, which is higher than the 6 milliseconds needed for transitions to occur within the refresh window at 165Hz. It's nowhere near as bad compared to the Dell G15 that I bought last year, but I cheaped out with the 120Hz screen there, and I wouldn't be surprised if they're using the same panel this year too. So again, expect worse results with that. The total system latency is the amount of time between a mouse click and when a gunshot fire appears on the screen in CSGO. Again, this year's model is faster compared to last year's, but part of that would be due to the slower response time of that 120Hz screen. Backlight bleed looked a little patchy towards the corners, but I never actually noticed any of this when viewing content normally. 
Now let's find out how well Dell's G15 gaming laptop actually performs in games and compares against other laptops. Now these games were all tested with G-Mode enabled, as at the time I had just assumed that that would be the best for gaming. And given these games are fairly GPU heavy, that's probably going to be fine compared to what we saw earlier in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Especially when we also compare games at the higher 1440p resolution, as this probably would get more of an advantage with that higher GPU power limit. Cyberpunk 2077 was tested the same on all laptops, and I've got the G15 shown by the red highlight. It's doing fairly well compared to others, and was slightly ahead of Lenovo's Legion 5i Pro just below it despite that having a higher maximum GPU power limit. A number of other 3070 Ti machines that run consistently at the highest possible 150 watt limit were ahead though. My G15 doesn't have a 1440p screen, but it's available with one, so we connected a monitor to test this resolution too. It's ahead of the Alienware M15 R6 from last year with RTX 3080 graphics, so a nice result. But not quite as good compared to those other 3070 Ti laptops with higher GPU power limits. That said, it could still easily beat higher tier 3080 Ti's with lower power limits. Red Dead Redemption 2 was tested with the game's benchmark tool. Again, the G15 was only a little behind those other 3070 Ti laptops that run with max power limit. But we're talking about a 6 FPS gap best case, which isn't really going to be a difference most people would actually notice when playing anyway. At 1440p, it's still able to beat some 3080 and even 3080 Ti laptops, so it just goes to show that performance also depends on the power limit of the GPU, and not just what tier of GPU is inside the laptop. In control, the G15 was around the middle of our 3070 Ti laptops, ahead of thinner designs with lower power limits, but not quite as good compared to those that can run up to 150 watts. Again, at 1440p, it's still able to beat 3080 Ti laptops that have lower power limits. For most people, it's not worth spending more money on the 3080 Ti, but I've already compared those two in depth in a dedicated video. Here are the 3D Mark results for those that find them useful. Now for some content creator tests. Adobe Premiere was tested with the Puget Systems benchmark tool. Like many of the games, the G15 was ahead of some 3080 and 3080 Ti machines, but machines with higher power limits were able to score better. Adobe Photoshop likes single threaded performance, and considering the Cinebench single core score from the G15 was below many other 12th gen i7 results, it's not too surprising to see it behind many of those laptops here too. DaVinci Resolve generally cares more about GPU power, however there were other lower wattage 3070 Ti laptops ahead of the G15 this time, so perhaps it's being held back by the fact that the processor was only running at 30 watts in G mode with the GPU fully loaded up, as we saw in the thermal testing earlier. Blender was tested with the open data benchmark, and the higher GPU power limit allows the G15 to basically tie with the other best 3070 Ti laptops that we've tested. We've also tested SpecViewPerf, which tests out various professional 3D workloads. The BIOS was pretty good. There are a lot more options to customize in here compared to most other laptop brands out there. The only one that I can think of that gives you more customization is MSI's Advanced BIOS. But yeah, overall Dell are offering some good options here that other laptops don't have. Linux support was tested with an Ubuntu 22.04 Live CD. By default, the keyboard, touchpad, speakers, camera, Wi-Fi, and Ethernet all worked. The keyboard shortcuts to open the calculator, adjust screen brightness, and adjust volume worked fine. But the shortcuts for keyboard brightness didn't work, and Gmode doesn't work either, as it seems to need Alienware's command center software, so you can't use it to boost the fans. Let's discuss pricing and availability next. This will change over time, so refer to the link below the video for current updates and sales. Dell are definitely known to run a lot of sales all the time. At the time of recording, Dell's G15 starts at around 940 US dollars for the i5 and 3050 configuration. Kinda pricey for a 3050 in my opinion. The 3060 options are over $1400, but also currently out of stock. And the 3070 Ti one I've got isn't listed at all right now on the US website, so I'm not sure how much it is. It's in stock here in Australia. 
we're talking about 3300 Australian dollars, which converts to roughly 2100 US dollars. So yeah, kinda pricey. All right, let's conclude. Should you buy Dell's G15 gaming laptop? Last year, the title of my Dell G15 review video included the tagline, impressive and disappointing. Now this year, I think I'm just impressed about how disappointed I am with it. That's not to say it's all bad. There are definitely some good parts of this laptop. I think it's just heavily outweighed by all the bad experiences we had. Not only did we find this year's version way less stable prior to my fix, but for some reason you can only install one M.2 SSD now, despite it even having the space available for another one. Hell, what are you doing? The software experience is as bad as it's always been. I could complain about that in depth in a dedicated video for ages. G mode performing worse in some games might also be confusing for users. 30 watts for a 14 core Intel processor clearly isn't ideal. Honestly, they probably shouldn't be boosting the GPU power up so high if the CPU has to run so low, especially for a 1080p screen, where games generally rely more on CPU power. Of course it does depend on the specific game and setting levels, but yeah, I think 30 watts is just too low for an Intel chip. Of course, Dell do also sell the G15 with a Ryzen 6000 processor, and it's possible, in fact likely even, that 30 watts on an AMD processor will get you more performance. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is if you have a G mode for gaming mode and you're turning it on and you're getting worse performance, it's just not ideal. But despite that, performance in games was actually pretty decent compared to other gaming laptops that had similar specs to this. It was also great to have both Advanced Optimus and G-Sync. Though I'm not sure if the other screen options have G-Sync or if it's just the 165Hz screen, because for some reason Dell doesn't even list G-Sync on the product page for the G15. So it was kind of just a nice surprise when I found it. But yeah, regardless, Advanced Optimus and G-Sync, it's a good combination that a lot of other laptops out there don't actually have. Dell's BIOS also offers a lot more customization compared to pretty much any other brand out there, except perhaps MSI. At the end of the day, our time spent testing the G15 could be summarized as frustrating. And this is why this video took more than a month to make. To be fair, it was much better once we stopped those random blue screens from happening. And I've got no idea if that's something that you or many other people are going to experience, especially if there's an update that fixes it. Assuming that's fixed, still I can't see them fixing the software anytime soon, and one M.2 SSD slot is kinda embarrassing for a 15 inch laptop. Personally, I'd be looking elsewhere after my time spent with this machine, if anything, just to get away from the software. If you're looking for a new gaming laptop, then check out this video next. I go through the top 5 machines that I've tested in the first half of 2022, which will give you a better idea of what you should consider instead. So I'll see you in that one next.